Hey, everybody. Just a heads up. In today's episode, we're talking to two wonderful guests, and one of them refers to the Humane Society pretty frequently. He's referring to his partnership with our other guest, uh, who is from the Kentucky Humane Society, a separate entity from the HSUS. We're really excited to have you for today and enjoy the episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Humane Voices. I'm Carrie. I'm here with Kelly. We are back after a much-deserved holiday break, I'm sure, for our guests as well. Um, We have a really fun one today. Um, Cat cafes, which we will talk to you about in a little bit, are becoming increasingly popular in the U.S., um, and we are excited to welcome some fellow cat lovers and allies from other organizations today. We don't run animal shelters here at the HSUS, but we love partnering with the incredible groups all over the country and all over the world that are really doing just, you know, amazing work in their communities. And we are incredibly excited about any strategy that helps get cats adopted. So Kelly, would you like to introduce our amazing guest today? I would love to. And I must share with you, Chuck and Alyssa, that I had a cat cafe this morning in my kitchen. I had my two cats. (laughs) And some coffee. So I have the feeling what you do is a little bit more involved in that, uh, but I'll let you cover that. But um, we have two guests, as you can see. We have Chuck Patton, who is the proprietor of <laughs> Perfect Day Cafe, but up bump. Uh, that is located in Louisville, Kentucky. And we also have Alyssa Gray, who is the president and CEO of the Kentucky Humane Society. Also, you're based in Louisville as well, I believe, Alyssa. Mm-hmm. And yes. for our Yankee listeners, that's Louisville, Kentucky. That's not Louisville, right? Did I say that correct? You did. Good job. Perfect. I was born in Nashville, so I know a little something about that area. So Yeah, so I'm very excited. Um, You know, of course, I already spilled the beans. I have cats and I love cats. But when you combine coffee, drinks, cats, you know, yoga, all of it, I'm sure we're going to get into. uh, That seems like a recipe for just a sheer dose of heaven. But for those listeners that maybe (laughs) have not uh, been a part of this trend or have one in their city or they're not in Japan, (laughs) hey, to our Japanese listeners, um, Alyssa and Chuck, and Chuck, we'll start with you. Share a little bit about what is the perfect uh, day cafe. What's a cat cafe? I I always tell people that a cat cafe is kitchen center, uh, meets a coffee shop, uh, and our so kind of a tavern. So <laughs> so we do we do serve me alcohol, but it's just you are that, in Louisville, you know, wouldn't you have to? I mean, come on. <laughs> We we do carry bourbon at the cafe, so. uh, but yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's it's what I have cafes is it really uh, as much as is that adoption piece of it as well for the community to come together, uh, community of animal lovers of of where that cafe is located. That's great. Now, Alyssa, I want to ask you this. So, okay, and you both are on here together for a reason. I'm going to have you share a little bit about this. So I know there's a relationship between the Kentucky Humane Society and with Chuck and his team at the Cat Cafe. Share a little bit about that partnership and kind of the synergy there. Sure. Um, it is incredible. I'll start with that. We we consider the Perfect Day Cafe and their team and, and Chuck part of our KHS family. Um, they do so much for our mission and, and for our cats um, and also our staff. You know, we, we are so fortunate that this partnership has helped us actually adopt more cats out than dogs <laughs> in the first wow. time in our history since 1884. Um, three years ago, it was the first year we did more dog or cat adoptions than dog adoptions because of the Cat Cafe. So it's it's been a very innovative partnership. Uh, we are so fortunate to be part of it. Um, you know, it's it's a, a great place to go to visit. Uh, it's been great for just getting the word out about what we do at KHS. Um, you know, some people come in there, have no idea that it's a partnership with a humane society. So Chuck and, and his team are great about sharing what, what we do as a whole um, and also just the, the mission of the Cat Cafe and finding homes for kitties. So you all form this partnership and you work together on this, but I'm curious, you know, one is that unique with other cat 
cafes in the country. Um, and how did that play out? Chuck, I don't know how it happened. Did you just approach Alyssa and say, hey, I'm a guy with a cat cafe and let's let's work together. Is that how it happened? I'm imagining there was a little more planning than that, but tell us about that a little. Yeah. Well, at the time that we started up, it was, it was you know, five years ago, a little over five years ago. So there was only about 50 cat cafes across the United States. And the concept of a cat cafe was not necessarily a given yet, you know, that people didn't necessarily know about it. So, you know, al although it was very well received and, and we sat down together with the Humane Society and talked a little bit about it, uh, there was a lot of unknowns. So we had to sit down. They called other cat cafes, uh, some of the cat cafes that I had seen, that I had visited and uh wanted to make sure it, it was a it was a sure thing and that could happen and and that would also help the humane society. Yes, yeah, so Alyssa on your end of it when he kind of came to the came to you pitched this idea I mean what were your thoughts? Were you hesitant? Were you um what did you think? Uh we were definitely intrigued, I will say. <laughs> Um, and excited, you know, it, Chuck had done a lot of research already and had visited cat cafes throughout, um, the, the world and in the state really, or the States. And, um, we had some, several conversations, but we were, we were pretty much in, I would say after the second conversation, um, yeah. and excited about it. It was, it was funny, you know, we, we've talked about this a few times and, we all remember our goal of 300 cats a year, and we thought that was a pretty good stretch, um, and we're thrilled to try to get there. And we blew that. Uh, Chuck and his team blew it out quickly. Incredible. Um, and we were just amazed. You know, it's for for me, I've been in animal welfare for 14 years, and um, this is one of the most surprising, neatest, innovative things I have mm. seen. And, and yes, you know, you asked Kelly about the uniqueness of it. Uh, a lot of cat cafes do partner with shelters, humane societies, rescues. Um, they all have their own type of model or what works for them. Uh, Chuck made it very important that his model was giving back to the community and making sure he was saving lives along the way. Mm -hmm. So we we are fortunate to say, I, I believe that we are still, um, we've been the most uh, of the humane societies to do the most adoptions of any cat cafe year to year. So very, so cool. very, very incredible for us. And um, yeah, honestly, astonishing, amazing. So I'm really curious, like, and and I think that probably both of you can speak to this in different ways, but I know that one of the things that many shelters sort of struggle with is first, you know, just like getting folks in the door. And second of all, that you have sort of like, there are challenges in terms of animals when they're in an unusual situation, when they're not used to, they don't quote show as well. Um, and so I'm curious about like, what are the sort of dynamics you experience with the cat cafe? Like, how does it change the dynamics of both the cat's behavior and how people interact with them? Well, for me, this was kind of the industry disruptor. It's it's mm -hmm. a huge hobby of mine, and and I love thinking outside of the litter box is what I call it. But <laughs> it's just it, one of the things that I, I think that the cat cafes have really done well is they create an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the experience itself is is, in my opinion, a new vertical that's going on within business. So if you see somebody throwing axes, or if you've escape rooms or some of those other things, people are looking for something to do and not just something to drink or something to eat. And so it, it, that trend started. And I think what we did is we combined that trend with the adoption piece of it and made mm -hmm. sure that it looks nice in there. Uh, it looks a lot of fun. You have coffee, you can hang out. All the cats or kittens are in one big room. So I believe that what has made this such the disruptor is instead of having the cats um, in in the in the hospital, if you will, you know mm -hmm. the, how the how the they take care of it, the shelter and and a lot of the clean protocols and some of that other this stuff. There's a lot of different things about a cat cafe. They have fluff, they have couches, and some of those pieces. And if you create that experience, then the public creates a lot of demand and they come in mm -hmm. and they 
and they adopt. <laughs> so it's a, it's a numbers game, just like businesses. So as an experience, I assume you'll have people that, you know, they may do a birthday party there. They may do, you know, I know uh, yoga and cats. And I mean, are you seeing a lot of that where people kind of take what's already an experience that you've built and then amplify that with, you know, creating their own experience within that? It, it is. The, some of the very typical things like you would paint, you know, have a paint class. Well, we have a per paint sip. And <laughs> <laughs> and that you're going to do the paint class and you're going to paint a cat, but you're going to go into the into the room. Uh, we have lots of kids events. We have private potties. We've had bachelorette party. We've had a wedding inside of the cat cafe. Between right. cats or humans, how did that play out? Yeah, I know. Actually, we've had both. We've had both. <laughs> we, we did humans once. And then another one, we had two bonded pairs and they bonded while they're at the cafe and they were just absolutely in love with each other. So we actually had an ordained minister who happens to work with us marry them. Oh. So I don't know if it was legal, but um, <laughs> we bonded the pairs and they got a double. <laughs> yeah. I think so that's, that's the next battlefront, cat marriage. Yeah. Legal yeah, I, I just want to say, I think it's really good that you didn't try to combine the cat cafe with the axe throwing experience. I think that <laughs> yes. would go very badly. So congratulations on selecting a more, a more. Yeah. Reasonable That's why you're a business there. entrepreneur, Chuck. Right. Yeah. Yeah. These things. Yeah. Don't the wrong step. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and Chuck, so, you, you even do dog events. You, you all, we, yeah. we do dog adoption events. Oh yeah. How do you manage events? that inter interaction? Like, are there, like, if there are dog events, like do the, do the cats go somewhere else while the dogs are there? Or like, how does that, how does that work? Well, it, it, actually we have a space outside. Um, it's called our catio. <laughs> so mm -hmm. porch area, it's got nice seatings and things like that. So we retrofitted it in order to make sure that, you know, we put wood up and all that good kind of stuff, but we put a gate and we have Wet Nose Wednesdays uh, that occurs on there. And um, basically, we bring four or five puppies and we book the outside area. Um, mm. We do that really late spring, some of the summer and in fall. But it, I mean, it books up every single time very, very quickly. So we will be running events for dogs and events for cats. Again, trying to be a place for the community. Mm. Uh, that we can support that animal lover mentality. Actually, it helps us a lot having the dogs there because we really want to try to broaden that market and make sure that it's animal lovers and not just your typical vertical of, of cat lovers. Mm -hmm. Because I, it's just so rewarding for somebody, for me, that somebody says, well, I'm a dog person. And it's probably because they've had grandma's mean cat or something like that. And, and then they go in the room and their face just... Oh, yeah. They're like I like this cat won't leave my lap and and they just don't realize it. And then they oh, so with a cat. Yeah. So that's rewarding. And so, OK, you have these activities, you have, you know, people coming and going, uh, visiting the cats. You have dog days, you have weddings, you know, cat yoga, all of that activity. So, Alyssa, how do you because I assume you all are involved somewhat with, you know, offering advice and consulting. How do you make sure that that environment, you know, is low stress for the cats or it's, you know, it's okay. it's uh, everyone's having fun. But for the cats, it's also not stressful. Same. Right, right. Um, it is, I will say, it's probably for a friendly cat and a cat that likes other cats um, to be in the, the the cat cafe socialization room for adoption and visiting. It is probably one of the best places for them for a shelter cat. Um, you know, they they get to be loved, visited with um, if they are a little stressed or want to take a nap. Um, they have some some shelves uh, that are actually made out of bourbon barrels, which is very Kentucky. Um, <laughs> On brand. And yeah. they, they, they do so many different things to make sure they're comfortable and happy. And our staff, before going to the Cat Cafe, we actually have a, a room um, that's a, a little smaller, but about the same size as the room they'll go in. So we try to match them prior. So we try mm -hmm. to make that match and make sure that they're going to be a, a happy cat or kitten that enjoys other cats and kittens. And that the colony, you know, in a way, um, is going to be successful and sh show well and, and be comfortable with people and, and kids. 
And if not, that's okay. You know, Chuck or, or someone from his team may call us and say this cat um, seems a little stressed or, um, you know, mm-hmm. just doesn't seem very happy. Let's let's try to switch one out. So we we make sure the cats, that's our, our number one concern. And it's, it's the team at the Perfect Day Cafe's number one concern mm-hmm. too. Um, that they're happy and healthy. You know, they'll, they'll call us if there's a little sneezing going on or upper respiratory so issues. Do you all do medical checks and check in on we kind do. of the health of the cat? Oh, wow. We do. So we're in constant contact uh, with the Cat Cafe team daily, uh, several times a day sometimes. Um, it just kind of depends. We actually, because of the success of the, the Cat Cafe, you know, each year they've done o- up to 1600 adoptions per year. So we had to add staff to our foster team and our vet services team just to be able to keep up with wow. the demand. That's um, fantastic. We wanted to do that because that means yeah. we're we're able to save more cats. You know, we are we're pulling and transporting from over 60 counties throughout Kentucky. And a lot of those counties are rural or low income and they don't have many outlets. So, you know, it's it's so fun to see, I think just in, in the past few years, we've really seen an increase of transport with cats mm. and they have a very positive outcome. Um, and at the cafe, sometimes they stay literally two hours until they're adopted. Uh, the turn, the, you know, the, the adoption rates and, and how quickly they get adopted there is, is faster than our other locations mm. usually. Well, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I'm, you know, I know in a shelter setting, kind of they go in, look around, maybe interact some with the cats, but I would imagine you get a lot of people that come in not expecting to walk out uh, either wishing to adopt or taking one with them or, you know, going through that process. I mean, does that happen often? At, at the cat cafe? Mm-hmm. I would say yes, um, and, and Chuck may, may be better on exact numbers because Chuck is so good at keeping stats, <laughs> uh, but we we have so many people that go, um, you know, maybe they're a parent supervising a birthday party, so they don't even go to visit with cats, but they might see one climbing and somewhere running around playing with their child, um, and they're like, oh, hey, what, is, what does it take to adopt? So I would say over 50% are not expecting to adopt and mm. leave leave That's with great. a cat or kitten because of it, it really is because of the experience and um the team there and you know we from the Kentucky Humane Society we do everything to get them ready for adoption so they're already altered they're up to date on all their shots um they're happy healthy and and they see them in a room with possibly 10 other cats and 10 people and they're thriving, they're happy, um, they're playing and they're running everywhere. So, you know, it's, it's just a perfect, perfect, just adventure that they're on. And they, yeah, they, a lot of times leave with the cats. <laughs> a little coffee to go, a latte and a cat. Uh-huh. Latte, yeah. cat. So, so Chuck, you- talk about that a little bit. Some of the demographics of, you know, who's coming in adopting cats, who are your cu- customers. Um, but also since you're the stats man that Alyssa said, give us some, give us some numbers, talk some, I know you talked about, you know, in the three years time, how you or you thought 300 you wanted to adopt out, you far exceeded that. Give us some of the success numbers. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's great. We knew we needed to really kind of lock in on that. And I wanted this to be a repeatable, learnable uh, situation. And to me that, you know, again, numbers don't lie. And we really wanted to to make sure that that was accurate. So yeah, we when we started it, we set up that number to be 300 at the time. That was the highest adopting center that the Humane Society had. They had a partnership with pet shops, which is a, a common way that some of the shelters are out there exposing the cats to people that are walking around. So um, the number is 1,700, by the way. So the past two years, we've adopted out 1,700 uh, cats wow. for the total year. And I love it when people come in and they say, well, what do you do with the cats that you know don't get adopted? And I said, I don't know, but if you'll give me your number, I'll call you when that happens. If that happens. <laughs> Great. <laughs> because I'm I'm proud of um we do brag a little bit about the numbers just because we feel as if we're bragging about our community. Mm-hmm. They have su- sincerely supported. And I would say that Alyssa is correct. You you are getting about 30 to depending on what time of the year, 30 to 50 percent of the people are not there to adopt. And one of the reasons why we know that is sometimes we get feedback from the shelters and say, Hey, why are you holding these cats? We really want you to send them home. And we'll say, Well, they don't like they don't even have a litter box at home. So we they're they're coming back tomorrow. 
to make sure that they get all those things. But um, so we t- we try to track it. The average kitten, which is defined as uh, for us zero to six months, stays at the at the Louisville Cafe at two point five days. Wow. Uh, and it's important to know of the 1,700, it's about a two-to-one ratio on the number of kittens to adults that we adopt. Okay. But still, that's o- almost 600 adults every year yeah. and, and seven, 1,700 kittens. And there's so many more kittens that are out there. Um, and yes, our county of Jefferson County could probably handle that. But the state is where I really love the the impact that the Kentucky Humane Society, their Love 120 virtue, which is let's let's try to help more than just ourselves. Mm. The rural parts are now just saying, oh, my gosh, you guys will take our cats. That's great. The average teenager, six to six months to a year, uh, stays there 2.61 days. And then the grand one in here, the average adult stays at our cafe 3.7 days. So that is still, I mean, even we, we switched over to adults mid-December and to sit at the end of the day and see an adoption counselor sit at a desk all day and these paperwork coming out every single hour and you all have done, we've done like seven adoptions and we have to call the Humane Society and said, we need to basically refill the whole room for adults. We need to that. restock. We need more cats. <laughs> <laughs> We call our cat contact and uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very humbling and it's very rewarding and everybody's exhausted, but it's a good exhausted. Well, it's- and so you said you're moving adults, kittens, but also you have special needs cats. Talk a little <laughs> bit about that too, that some of your special needs cats, Alyssa, that the cat cafe is moving and they're getting adopted too, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They have, um, they have two other spaces that's not the main cat room that they use for different reasons or different cases um, throughout the year, which has been again, very unique for us. Um, You know, during one quick example, I definitely want to make sure I mention when, you know, the beginning of COVID, when everything happened, um, bars and restaurants were, were shut down, you know, that was, that was closed um, by, by law. And so that meant the cat cafe uh, wasn't able to operate. And the, the team at the cat cafe said, well, we are still going to come in and please bring cats here. You know, we're happy to help. Mm -hmm. So they kept their doors open for the staff to be able to care for cats. And that made us able to have a additional location um, because we all know how, how hard that time was. Mm -hmm. And we were able to save more lives because of that. And throughout that whole period, they were, they were fostering on their own. Um, You know, the staff has done hundreds of fosters at their home um, and they helped with volunteering during that time. They weren't working. Uh, They weren't, you know, working and, being being part of the adoption process with the cat cafe, but they were part of our our team and our family by just helping our shelter, um, passing out food, doing amazing things. So they're an incredible team. Um, and the 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 rooms, the other rooms, they they use for at that time just to help care for cats and hold cats. But they use them at any other time throughout the year for many special needs kitties, uh, mom and babies that need some extra socialization. Um, you know cats with feline leukemia or FIV, um, you know, special cases where if they can't be with other cats, they'll keep them up there. And a lot of times they're overlooked when they, when someone comes to visit the shelter, but at the cat cafe, again, it's such a positive experience and people um, just love connecting with the cats there and their team know those cats so well that they, they really do sell them and find them a forever family. So they've, they've adopted, you know, hundreds of special needs kitties or older kitties, or, you know, just kitties that sometimes get overlooked in the shelter. How did you guys, when you guys first started doing this project, I, I think Chuck, you sort of answered this for me earlier, but I was curious about, so do cats get direct adopted directly from the cat cafe or do they have to go back to the humane society to get adopted? Or how did you guys sort of set up the protocol for that? Well, I, I think that's one of the most important parts of this as well, too. We wanted to make that process pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so w- we go into the database. We're directly dialed into the Kentucky Humane uh, Society database. All of our managers are trained on the adoption process. But right. yeah, fill out an application. We go through the application uh, we have to do things like declaw councils and some of those mm-hmm. other things. It's not it's not super easy, but the goal there 
as much as we love our cafe, as much as we think it's cute and beautiful, it's an extension of a shelter. Mm. And we openly tell people, we think we're very proud of our place, but it's not as great as your home. So we want to make sure that we get them in and get them out. And Mm -hmm. I I almost think, you know, from a business aspect, it's so important that we keep that pipeline moving because what happens is if I can take in more kitties, then the Humane Society brings them to us. And then the Humane Society brings them to us, then they can open up more spots. And then they reach out to other shelters, you know, again, Eastern Kentucky, uh, the floods that recently took place here, Mm, uh, all all of those places that the Humane Society just brings them in. Most of the reasons why shelters don't do that is because they're like, all right, if I bring them in, what am I going to do with them? Because I can't get them adopted that quickly. Mm -hmm. So we just really remained focused on that, make sure it could all be done at the cafe, make sure that it was all turnkey, uh, and make sure that we can send them home as quickly as they can to a safe and, and, and to a vet and to a loving home. I mean, it, it seems like it's just so win-win for obviously the cats, for the shelter. Um, you know, it clears out the shelter to make room for, you know, other animals, uh, the customers, you know, those that are looking for an event space and to do something unique. Um, but it's also, it's a business, Chuck, and it's, I assume it's a successful business because you've not only lasted past the dreaded year or two, but during COVID years, you know, you've continued on. So it sounds like even as a business model, this type of partnership and helping and working with the nonprofit and combining, um, all of these different elements, it's succeeding too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, as I started the business up, I I really had to kind of clarify, do a lot of different um, research on things. So this is what I call a social enterprise business. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen Tom's shoes, that uh, once you buy a shoe, you donate one uh, Mm -hmm. or uh, Boomba socks, again, donating socks per purchase to the homeless. And um, we really wanted to be able to do that. I I wanted to focus up on starting a business with a purpose. And I wanted people to join us and say, I don't want any other job. I want something where I know that I'm making an impact, impact on our community. And when we start involving not only our people, but the community in that, it the volumes, it just, it's- So can I ask you, Chuck, you mentioned staff. I assume there's not a lot of turnover even in your staff. You know, for the normal reasons, people get burnt out because they feel like they're doing something good, you know, that your staff's involved in this. Yeah, we do. We 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 have a tremendous amount of OGs, you know, original gangsters, the, the people that started with us from the beginning. And um, it, it, for a retail position, yeah, there is just not that much turnover at all. And everybody feels vested and that's mm. that's his rewarding thing as a as a as a boss if you will when people say hey chuck i want to do a kids craft day where we make things for the humane society or i want to do a pajama party or i want to do a we did a noon year's eve miss sweeney's noon year's eve so <laughs> she's just one of our team members that says i want to be vested in this i want to help how do we do that and when everybody buys into that, the, the public feels that energy mm. and feel so humble today. If you look on our weekends, I mean, they're almost always fully booked uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. And when it becomes summer, when when the schools are out uh, in between that Christmas, New Year's, again, we were fully booked almost the t- entire time from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. Mm. Uh, and that's what's led us to the four years and over 70, just under 7,400 adoptions in that four and a half years. It's amazing. Yeah. It really is amazing. And I just love that you both kind of did a bit of a leap of faith to do this together, but it's benefited, you know, the business, but also, Alyssa, it's benefited the shelter. Yes. So just before we we wrap up, y'all, I'd be really curious, Alyssa and Chuck, if, if other people were interested in sort of getting involved in an effort like that, do you have any sort of tips and tricks or things not to do for people who want to get started? I mean, aside from obviously the axe throwing cat combination, I don't want to do that, but are there other things that you would say do, don't do for people wanting to start their own cat cafe that's doing adoptions? Yeah. I mean, I get, I get those calls. Uh, I mean, I, I called, somebody called me yesterday from a franchise and I told them no. And then but I get it, you know, two and three of those, uh, 
calls a month. And mm-hmm. the one of the things that I think is important about it, it, because it is still a business, it still takes a great deal of investment to create the kind of space that um, people want to experience. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. You can't control Mother Nature, which is a very odd thing to where if you had a business, you know, if you started a coffee shop, you can purchase coffee beans anywhere. But when we have health issues, it's something you have to prioritize the cat and you shut down for two or three days. So it it's a different dynamic. And I tell people that it sounds weird, but it it's not enough to love cats. Um, it's just not. You have to want to truly make an impact. And I think that that's where it has to come from because you're going to make a tremendous amount of sacrifice. I'll go four or five days without petting a cat. And, and, and it's, it's just, it's a matter of finding the love for watching these go home mm-hmm. more so than it is, uh, you know, to be able to spend time with them. Although that is a French benefit of, of everything is you just place will close down and I'll go in there and kind of relax. But, um, but yeah, I, I, it is, it is a rough work. It is difficult. And the other thing is there's no, you're getting more of models nowadays, but when we started this one, it, people hadn't even heard of what a cat cafe was. Alyssa, anything you'd want to add from the shelter perspective? You know, I think, um, like you said, taking taking a risk, a leap, leap of faith was part of it, but we worked so closely together to establish SOPs and make sure our vet team was very involved um, for the health mm-hmm. of the cats and the well-being of the cats. And it's it's just become a, a partnership that both of us benefit so strongly from um, that we are 100% in it for the right reasons. And the team that supports it and makes it happen every day, um, like like Chuck said, they do it because they love it. And it's it's part of their their life. Um, I think also, you know, with with this partnership, it's been more than for for us, it's been more than just the lives saved of the cats. Um, this team, they give back to the Kentucky Humane Society financially every single year. Um, they just did our end of the year New Year's, New Year's Eve match challenge uh, that helped us raise an additional $20,000 at the end of the year. So they, you know, they're involved every single event we have throughout the year, all of our annual fundraisers. Um, so it's it's just been, it's, you know, hopefully a lifelong partnership with the Kentucky Humane Society and, and PDC. So I think if you're thinking about doing this, talk, if, you know, if there's a partnership that's potentially out there, please talk to each other and utilize us. You know, we at the Kentucky Humane Society are happy to talk to any shelters, rescues, um, and just answer questions to see if it's a, a good move for them. And it might not be as as big as as we are, um, but that doesn't mean it, it couldn't be successful. And, you know, every life saved is extremely important, as we all know. So there might be a model that's a little different, but, um, you know, they can, they can learn for, uh, from us. And we would love to see more opportunities like that like this out, out in the community and with other shelters. Y'all, thank you so much for this, uh, our, your time today and for this incredible work. I think it's really inspiring and hopefully yeah. our, our listeners will feel so too. Um, maybe they'll stop by and have some bourbon soon. Um, <laughs> if there's anything, if there's nothing else, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap. It's been a wonderful episode. Thank you guys for being here and we will see you next time on Humane Voices. Humane Voices.